Hey, what's up guys? It's Matt with The Movement System. If you are studying for the NSCA CSCS exam, this webinar should be tremendously helpful for you. We're gonna go over study strategies, free resources to study, the three most important chapters to study, and a lot more. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Yeah, man. Yep. So if you, if you guys don't know, this is Matt Castro. We have sort of a blended group here today. Some of his folks, some of my folks, some of you guys have probably never heard us before, uh, but we thank you for joining in. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Mash from Barbell Rehab. I'll be hosting today and I'm super excited to have Matt Castro, SPT, CSCS and guru of helping people pass the CSCS on board today for our first joint webinar SPT stands for Student Physical Therapist. I'll let Matt do his introduction, but as he said, make sure you head to Instagram and do a couple of things for us. First, follow at Barbell Rehab, follow at The Movement System, and then when you get to your favorite slide, uh, take a screenshot, tag both of us, and let us know where you're from, right? Because we got people from all around the world today. Um, all right, what do you say we get started here? I'll let, I'm gonna turn my video off. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt. I'm the owner and founder of The Movement System. So uh, let me just give you guys a little bit of background. I did an, an undergrad degree in exercise science. I really liked exercise science. I loved it. I, and the biggest thing I like to do is teach other people about anything I learned. So as soon as I learned anything, I wanted to teach the personal training clients that I was working with. I wanted to teach classmates. I wanted to make videos about it. And I just really love teaching people. And really what that's turned into over the past year and more was tutoring people and you know teaching more people about information regarding the CSCS exam. So many of you guys probably know me from either the Facebook group. If you are in the Facebook group, guys, give me like a thumbs up uh, if you think the Facebook group is cool and helpful. And that will tell everyone who's not in the Facebook group that they should join because it's an awesome group, the Strength and Conditioning Study Group on Facebook. Uh, and I started that almost actually a year ago. I didn't realize it was, it's been that long. But about a year ago, I started the Strength and Conditioning Study Group and started to just do these videos about topics about strength and conditioning, you know, a video on endocrine, a video on cardiovascular physiology, on periodization, on plyometrics, on sprinting. on And, and these videos, you know, you guys really have taken off and supported so well and like you know always always leaving nice comments always saying nice things and always asking for more which is what i love I, I love that you guys are really willing to learn it's a great group my goal really is to make that the best strength conditioning group that exists on the planet and to use that group to make the world stronger and that's really my ultimate goal is to teach people things teach you guys the coaches of the world things that you can actually go and and do to implement and then make your athletes stronger and make the world stronger. So the, the whole point of the movement system and the strength conditioning study group and the, the movement system podcast, the movement system YouTube channel is to make the world stronger. And uh, you know I really appreciate everyone's support and we have a really good group there. Uh, I am pursuing a doctorate in physical therapy at Ohio State right now. I'm in my third year. Uh, I'm in my last year, which is like mostly clinical rotations. So doing like outpatient neurologic physical therapy right now. Uh, I'll also be in sports physical therapy and in uh, acute care PT over the next year. I'm getting clinical experience. So, you know, it's really been nice actually working with, with Michael and with other, you know, PTs and rehab professionals to tie this information of strength and conditioning knowledge into the world of physical therapy and rehab and prehab uh, and, and try to make those connections between the clinical side of things and the and the practical side of things. So guys, that's my background. I wanna know, are you guys coaches? Are you students? Are you personal trainers? I, I've been all of those things and, and still all of those things. I actually have a personal training client tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm pretty limited in, in personal training now just with the amount of stuff with this Facebook group and, and PT school. But you know, I've been a strength and conditioning coach at the high school level. I did an internship at the college level at Ohio State with varsity athletics, you know, working with track and field, volleyball, basketball, baseball, you know, lacrosse, soccer, swimming. I want to know, what do you guys, so a lot of personal trainers, oh man, they're coming in too fast to read. Student assistant, personal trainer, DPTs, awesome, other DPTs in here, nice. PT, personal trainer, athletic trainer, cool. I haven't been an athletic trainer, that's the one I haven't done. Nice, guys, nice, nice. Chiropractic, cool, two of them, nice. 
All right, guys, that's awesome. And hopefully we can, uh, this is the way the, the Facebook group already works, is bringing all of our diverse experiences. And then when people pose a question or whenever I pose a poll or whenever I put a video out, we can all bring our experiences in to answer those questions and grow together, which is which has really been awesome. And that's, I think, really why the group's taken off. It's not because of me. I, I kind of just set the foundation out there. I guide people. But really, it's it's you guys making the most of the experience and, and making the most of the questions and learning from it and asking more. All right, this is the overview, guys. Let's let's kind of talk about how this webinar will work. What is the CSES exam? So we'll talk about that first. Uh, I'll try to give some like tips and tricks of things that I've learned. Uh, I took the CSES exam about three, three, four years ago. It was early 2017, uh, whenever I was doing a strength conditioning internship at Ohio State Varsity Athletics. But then I've kept up and I've had a lot of friends take it, tutored people taking it, and then obviously made this group and got tons of questions over the last year You know, from that. I'm going to try to answer a lot of the questions you guys have, but then we'll also do that Q&A at the very end. I'm also going to talk about some practical stuff, give you guys some, some tips and study strategies, study resources. We'll talk about a study timeline. And then also talk about getting a strength and conditioning job and, and what do you actually do once you get those letters behind your name and what kind of doors does that open for you and, and what to do. Okay, so what is the CSCS? The NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, has a number of certifications, personal trainer and other ones, but the kind of the gold standard certification in, in the industry of sports and even within personal trainers, the CSCS is really the gold standard. And that's because there's a significantly higher education level required to pass the CSCS than there is for a CPT exam, a certified personal trainer exam, or uh, you know, you know, any of the other certifications. Really, that gold standard is what makes this certification so valuable and what helps you stand out from the average personal trainer out there or the average coach out there. Uh, most sport coaches don't have the knowledge of a CSCS. So really, it, it combines the strength conditioning, the exercise science knowledge with the practical sport training and strength training knowledge. And that's really what makes this the gold standard. Who is it for? And this is a really good question. A lot of you guys just said your coaches, personal trainers, maybe PT students, athletic trainers. That's really a, a lot of who this is for. Uh, sport coaches can certainly take this too. And I would definitely encourage sport coaches to take this certification. It's a great amount of knowledge and a great amount of information. And, and really, guys, I can't state enough how much knowing the information from the CSCS book and from the CSCS has helped me develop as a coach. I went from not being confident at all, basically, in helping someone achieve improved sprint speed or vertical jump or endurance and just kind of like having ideas, having a lot of pieces. Once I had really gained the foundational knowledge from this exam to really being better able to understand how to actually write programs how to actually connect energy systems all the way to training decisions, how to make those critical connections that actually improve athletic performance. Um, so this is, it's a stressful chapter in your life trying to study for this and get all this information and understand all these complex topics. But I promise you guys, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's it's really incredible to, to just feel like you actually can help athletes achieve optimal performance. And you can see the the results that you're getting athletes and it's really a good feeling and I, I really just want to help everyone else get there and and learn what they can to again make the world stronger uh this is this is interesting right here guys pass rate of around 56 percent there's going to be some debate out there but honestly i think this is in some ways a good thing if there was a 95 percent pass rate to this exam it wouldn't be that meaningful and, and it's actually a really good thing. This is a challenging exam. There, it, obviously, it's not a perfect exam and, and things could be better and, and this and that. But at the end of the day, it's a good thing that there's a high barrier to entry for this exam because once you do get over that hurdle and you do pass, it means something. It means that you, got so, you put yourself and attained this high level of knowledge and understanding that other people don't have. So, guys, I, there's a you know, a good and a bad side of that, the fact that this really is so difficult. Uh, I took the exam one time and I did pass on the first try. Uh, again, though, I had a, a strong exercise science background and um, I did read the entire book, literally every page, took notes on it. I had 
a hundred and some pages of notes. So I went overboard studying for sure. So there's two parts of this exam. And this is important, guys. There's a scientific foundations portion of the exam and there's a practical applications portion of the exam. Depending on your background, you right now might be more prepared for one or the other. I actually wanna know which of the two parts of the exam are you more worried about? Are you more concerned about the scientific foundations or the practical applied portion? There's been some rumors out there of which one's harder and I'm, I'm gonna give you my opinion in a second about which one's harder. Uh, the scientific foundations or the practical application, but I just want to hear from you guys. What do you? What are you specifically more worried about? The scientific foundations or the practical applied? Guys, the one that's harder. The answer for this is it depends. For the for the student out there, so maybe you're a physical therapy student or a exercise science student, and you've had a lot of in in the classroom educational type of a background. For you, it actually might be harder to do the practical side because there's gonna be a lot of video-based questions, a lot of looking at a program and analyzing some aspect of the program or, or some periodization scheme, and you're gonna to have to understand that side of it, which you might not, because that's really not covered. Even in exercise science class, I, I had an entire four-year degree on exercise science and barely understood periodization by the end of it, seriously. Honestly, I, I just think that the classroom setting gives a lot of times gives you a better understanding of the scientific foundations, but the practical, sometimes you do need, uh, you know, to actually work with strength coaches rather than just professors to get that. If you guys have been a coach uh, for a while, then there's actually a good chance that you're going to be set up for that practical applied because you've seen a lot of programs, you've written programs, you've seen a lot of athletes movements, uh, but maybe not quite so uh prepared for the scientific foundation side and maybe you actually need to dive into that hard science a little bit more hey matt i just put a poll up looks like people 57 percent practical applied and 42 percent foundations 50 set more people are more concerned about practical applied. yeah yeah so um, it sounds like it yeah. uh, that practical is is tough it's tough for a couple of reasons it's tough because there's some some really technical elements that you have to understand in the way that the nsca promotes programming and uh, exercise technique, because in reality, uh, coaches out there obviously promote different techniques for different reasons, for different athlete populations, but there are some universal principles that you kind of have to understand for the exam in regards to programming and technique. So uh, I'm just saying that understanding, you know, conjugate and French contrast training and stuff like that isn't necessarily going to help you because you really have to understand kind of the the basic linear periodization model and, and to kind of apply that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a, in, in a second. All right. When it comes to the scientific foundations portion, you take this portion of the test first. This is an hour and a half test and there's 95 questions. So it's pretty quick, but I haven't heard from a lot of people that it feels super rushed. One minute per question uh, roughly uh, around there for, for both portions, the practical, uh, you get a little bit more time. The scientific foundations is a little bit less than a minute per question. But that said, there's three answer choices for each question. So A, B, C, and you're like, oh, that's great. There's only three, but those are usually three really good answer selections. And, and you'll hear from a lot of people that take the test, man, I was able to eliminate one, but I was 50, 50 between the other two, because they do really give you some good answer selections. Uh, but topics you're going to see on the scientific foundations are muscle physiology, cardiac physiology, bioenergetics, that's like how we make energy with our body, endocrine, that's hormones and stuff, biomechanics, levers and muscle movement planes and stuff like that, uh, sports psychology, macronutrients, meal timing, uh, you know, all this covered in, in nutrition. Practical applied. This portion of the exam, guys, this is the exercise technique, program design, organization, administration, testing, evaluation, and there's going to be a lot of pictures and videos on this section. This, again, can be a, a difficult section for a lot of people, even if you do have experience, because again, there is kind of a certain way to go about some of these questions. Let's go ahead and, and get into this next part, which I'm really excited about, guys. This is a question that I get a lot. What is the number one study resource? What do I recommend having helped hundreds of people pass the CSCS exam by this point over the last you know two years. What do I recommend as the absolute number one study resource? And this is it, guys. The book, The Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. I do recommend having the fourth edition of this book. 
Uh, the third edition, there's been some updates. They split the nutrition chapter, updated some of the psychology, updated uh, some of the errors in the other book. So ideally getting this fourth edition. And this, guys, this is the book. I'll show you here too. I have it right here. This is, is a thick book. It's a little over, I think, 700-ish pages. And you're going to want to read all of it. <laughs> that said, I do think there are certainly some chapters that you can go a little bit quicker through and some to really focus on it. In about a minute or two here, I'm going to give you the three chapters that I would read every single bit of and really focus on. And then I'll talk about some chapters that mm, not quite as much, but you should still know. <laughs> also, I would want to point out that the, the exam is also based on current evidence. And this kind of tricks people up because they think, oh, well, there's a question that I saw that wasn't in the book. Well, most questions are going to be in the book and covered at some point, even if it's small or within a chart or something like that, you'll be able to find here. But there are some questions that have been updated since the publishing of this book and are based on current research. So if you are in the strength and conditioning study group, which I hope you are, I'm going to try to keep posting current evidence, uh, maybe just posting the article and a little summary of some things to know from that. If this would be helpful for you guys. Just comment like research and I'll, I'll try to you know be more diligent about posting research to the group uh, because I do think that is important to try to keep up with. Guys, take notes as you go through the book. The more actively you can learn, the better. The, the more actively you can quiz yourself and check your answers and, and really think through these things, the better. Let's get into what chapters to know in and out. So these are the three most important chapters, I think. Again, this is just my opinion, but this is what I've seen over the last year, helping hundreds of people study and pass for this exam. These are the three chapters that I would really go through multiple times and know all the bold terms, know all the definitions, make sure you understand every bit of it. So here they are, I'm about to hit the button. And there it is. All right, guys, so this is it. Chapter 10, nutrition for maximizing performance. This is really important. The, the other nutrition chapter, the second nutrition chapter is like kind of the nutrition basics. And it gets into a lot of advanced stuff on like fatty acid chains and and some stuff that's not quite as important. When you get to nutrition for performance, know every single thing in this chapter. Guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, in the next few slides here, pull out some key things from each of these three chapters as examples of what to actually pull out of the chapter, what to learn and, and what to think about. But yeah, this is something to keep on the radar. Definitely make sure you remember nutrition for performance. Next one, this is actually combined, it's, it's two chapters, but they're, I don't know that they're short. They're, they're actually kind of hard. But chapters 12 and 13, guys, you have to know testing, administration, selection, scoring, and interpretation. This is not just vertical jump test, hexagon test, like that kind of thing. It's also the scoring of it. It's what does the word Z score mean? What's validity? What's reliability? What's statistical? All these statistical terms, right? I would know that stuff. That's really important. The reason that they want you to know this, a lot of the reason, is because this is important for actually evaluating research and objectively testing athletes to make sure that they're improving. So it's one thing to just write a vertical jump program, and maybe it's six weeks and it has a bunch of jumping exercises, and maybe it helps your athletes or maybe it didn't. But if you actually know the correct testing to do on how to perform the tests, what tests to do for each sport how to administer the test, how to compare those tests to normative data, how to actually see based on assessments if your athletes are above average, below average, what your athletes need to train more in. If you can actually understand all of that, it's going to make you a better coach. So these are technical chapters. You have to really understand the details of these. And that's why I put the testing, administration, and scoring on this three most important chapters to know. All right. Next one, guys, chapter 21, periodization. Now, in reality, there's a lot of ways to program. You'll hear things like undulating periodization and conjugate periodization and French contrast training and linear periodization, reverse linear periodization. And it's super overwhelming. It's like, what is all that stuff? And you could just be spinning your wheels if all you do is see Instagram posts and see articles online and, and stuff like that. I would recommend fundamentally really understanding linear periodization first. Worry about that the most. Really understand why. Really understand why we do higher volume training in the off season. Well, 
the reason for that is primarily because off season, the athletes aren't doing a lot of sport training. So they have the capacity in their bodies to actually recover from high volume training. Uh, generally, they're they're doing hypertrophy work with that high volume training because they want to build strength and size and build their frame before they start to get to the season. In preseason, typically, we start doing more plyometrics, more sport specific drills, a little bit less volume of training with more volume of sport specific training. And the reason for that is because the more the closer you get to the season, the more sport specific you want to get because that's when those skills will actually transfer to performance. So the goal becomes less physiological muscle building. And then in the preseason, the goal becomes more of the motor adaptations, the motor learning of the specific movement patterns that you're going to use for the sport. And it's really important to fundamentally understand that because whenever you're reading a question, you're seeing sets and reps and things like that. It's, you have to be able to fundamentally understand why the linear periodization model exists so that you can answer those types of questions. If that was helpful for you guys, just, you know, give me a thumbs up or something. We're going to go into periodization a little bit more. So even if you're a little bit overwhelmed by just that, uh, join the strength conditioning study group, watch my linear periodization video on YouTube, uh, just see it from multiple places, you know, and that's really what's going to help to understand and really hammer down these concepts. Honorable mention. Honorable mention uh, is the psychology of athletic preparation and performance. This gets an honorable mention because it's significantly increasing in importance. And although there are some details in the chapter that aren't quite as commonly tested, you can expect a lot of questions on nutrition, like 20 questions. Although you probably won't see 20 questions on you know, psychology necessarily, it might be a lesser number of questions. They're difficult questions and they're, they're increasing the number of questions, especially in 2020. So I'm guessing if you're on this webinar, you haven't passed the test yet and you're, you're studying and you're gonna take it in 2020 or 2021. So this is something that's gonna be important is that actually really hammer down those sports psychology. All right, guys, let's go ahead into some key facts. And this is whenever you're reading through the nutrition chapter, uh, specifically this is chapter 10, nutrition for maximizing performance some things that you should be thinking to pull out of that chapter and really remember. Pre-competition nutrition. Guys, the way that I recommend doing this, and this is what's worked for me, what's worked for a lot of people, is to remember the pre-competition recommendations for a 150 pound person. It's kind of the average athlete. And the reason that I always do that is because it's super easy. I can just remember that about an hour out of competition, you consume about 35 grams of carbs. Two hours out, it doubles to 70 grams. Four hours out, it doubles to about 140 with a bigger window, like lower end, like 100 up to you know 240 or something like that grams. But I roughly can remember without having to really super memorize anything. I just roughly know that uh, an athlete sitting there before competition is digesting about 35 grams of carbs. So if you have one hour to digest them, the athlete can consume 35 grams. Two hours out, 70 grams. Four hours out, about 140 grams for the average athlete. Now, it, could you remember the grams per kilogram in all the different cases and all the different charts and the norms and all that? Yes, but definitely remember one. And then if you remember that average athlete, if you forget some of the details of all the charts, you can go back to that one thing that you do remember and at least use that as a reference and make a better educated decision on questions based on that. So just, just to point, put out there, guys, try to remember the basics first and then reach out. If you try to memorize every chart in the nutrition uh, section, that's just going to be overwhelming and you're going to be spinning your wheels. If you get one concept down, apply it to a couple questions and then branch out, that's a better study strategy. So if you take nothing else away from the webinar, take that away. Learn one thing really well and then branch out to the details. Big picture first. All right. We're going to get into program design key facts and then uh, key facts for the third one as well. All right. Intra workout nutrition. So, guys, this is another big one. Intra workout is about for an athlete's one gram of carb per minute. That means that while you're running, you can digest roughly one gram of carb per minute. That means 60 grams per hour. If we know that a one gram of carb is four calories, 
that means that athlete, athletes can consume roughly 240 calories per hour of a Gatorade and a banana or something like that, right? So again, yes, this has some variability, right? If an athlete has a, a poor GI system and they don't have good digestion, maybe they can only consume half a gram per minute and about 30 grams per hour. That's the low end. If an athlete's well-trained, a lot of tour cyclists and stuff have a really well-trained digestive system, they can potentially consume up to 120, 130 grams per hour. But if you remember that one gram per minute and you always remember that, then you can apply that to the question and, and at least lead yourself in the right direction and make sure you're not just spinning your wheels. So that's just another example of remember one thing and then branch out. All right. Uh, protein recommendations, guys, I really do recommend remembering these. Aerobic athletes, 1.0 to 1.6. Strength athletes, 1.4 to 1.7. There is some gray area, obviously, here between some sport athletes. Honestly, it's pretty safe to do that 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight. So when in doubt, if you're looking for a soccer player, a lacrosse player, or a field hockey player, and you're like, eh, they have some of both. Like They have some strength component and some aerobic component to their sport. I would calculate what do they need based on the one and a half grams per kilogram body weight. So say they're a hundred kilograms, they would, you would do the one and a half times that to get 150 grams. If you see they're consuming 60 grams, you know, they're way under and it doesn't even matter. You know, they're way under. If you see they're consuming, uh, you know, 80 grams way under, if you see they're consuming 200, they're way over. Right. So, you know, definitely remember that baseline, be confident doing that. And then remember the ranges as much as you can. All right, let's keep rolling here. Some testing and administration key facts. I, guys, you really need to make these connections all the way from looking at a sport, even if you haven't played that sport, just watching that sport, all the way from the energy system of that sport to practical decision making about the work to rest ratios to use, the tests to use. So for example, we have to be able to look at a volleyball game or match going and see that athlete's running, they're doing a lot of change of direction, their plays are lasting 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds. That means that they're probably using the anaerobic glycolysis system primarily for energy. And that means that the 300 yard shuttle is probably a good test for this athlete, as well as something that's change of direction. Right, because we, we have to make that connection all the way from the sport and the energy system demands to training decisions and practical testing decisions. Another sport, lacrosse, for example, is a lot more maneuverability. Just because of the nature of the sport, they're they're doing some quick changes of direction, but a lot of it is maneuvering around players and getting into positions. So something like the Illinois agility test, the three cone test, or the hexagon test, where you're going a little bit less sharp around cones is sport specific for that. So again, guys, you have to, you have to watch your sports through the lens of a strength coach and through the lens of a performance specialist and actually make these decisions. And some of this comes with experience. Some of this comes with, you know, an internship or, or just reading the book and applying the information. Right. And then also in this chapter is types of validity. So let's keep rolling here. I want to make sure we have enough time to get through this. Um, if you guys want to learn more about types of validity, I did a seven hardest CSCS questions Facebook live recently in the Facebook group. And, and the last question was all about validity. And I talked about content versus construct versus face validity. Go and check that out. Periodization. Guys, you should be able to take a blank piece of paper, completely blank piece of paper, just like this, and write a basic linear periodization program. So I, I really mean that. No book, nothing in the room set a piece of paper down on a desk and just draw like off season, pre-season, in season, and write some basic exercises, rep ranges, and percentage of one rep max to use. This actually took me a long time to really fundamentally understand enough to do this. And I'm gonna give you guys the example. So I'm just, I literally just did this while I was making this PowerPoint for the webinar. I just took out a black piece of paper. If you want to just close your eyes for the next section. Uh, and you could compare yours to mine after, but I'm just going to go ahead and give you the one that I did. Oh, and another concept to remember, guys, is is in general, we're moving from general work to sport-specific work as you approach the season. If you take nothing else out of this webinar, remember that. All right. This is the one I did just last night. It, obviously, it's not perfect. Uh, someone will have some complaints about this, I'm sure, but it's just a basic way to understand periodization. 
So we have the off season, the preseason, the in season, and the postseason. So you can see off season. I decided to put some general exercises, some goblet squats, some weighted push ups, some chin ups, some walking lunges, and then I chose a fartlek run, which is kind of this like. Uh, moderate intensity run. A lot of times that's used for like aerobic base work or, you know, just some general aerobic conditioning. So this, the goal of the off season in the linear periodization model, just to be clear, this could be for a soccer player. This could be for a basketball player, a lacrosse player, field hockey player, cricket player, whatever. This kind of program could work for any of those sports. Obviously based on the sport, you would make some extra decisions to, to be more sports specific sp specifically preseason and in season but this again is just to give you the big picture all right so big picture i'm doing hypertrophy rep range three sets of 15 three sets of 14 two sets of 15 this is a high volume workout you know four by 40 yard lunges uh, and some aerobic base work about 60 percent one rep max that's my off season plan and if you see a, a program that looks like this on the exam and you're like and they're saying, does this fit for an athlete using the linear periodization model in the off season, preseason, or in season or postseason? Pick off season because it's high volume, uh, low intensity, lower intensity, right? 60% of one rep max, and it has some aerobic base work. I'll do it off season. This would not make a lot of sense in season because it's probably too much volume, right? You're 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 already doing a lot of sport volume performing. It might get them too sore to perform. This would not necessarily make a great program in season for most sport athletes. Again, using the linear periodization model. Uh, Preseason, I threw in some power work here. So we're starting to work into power cleans, back squats, incline bench press, inverted row. You can see sets of four, sets of six, sets of eight. So this is more of a strength and getting into a power goal. Strength and power are... We're actually working 80 to 90% one rep max here. We're getting pretty intense, moderate volume, moderate to high intensity preseason here. Uh, and then also working some agility drills with the sport coach, getting more sport specific. A lot of times we're going to be doing this off season program more frequently, drop the frequency of strength training and do more sport training in the preseason. Uh, and then in season, this is the most sport specific. So, this is where we're doing fast trap bar deadlifts, front squats, bench press. What you'll notice here, guys, this is super low volume, right? This is, really means one set of five. Like you're getting into the bar doing five reps. You might do a warm up set or, or two, but you're getting a, one working set of five reps for front squat, and that's it. Because you want the stimulus to maintain your strength, to maintain your power without the fatigue. And we know that fatigue is very volume related. Hopefully this is helpful for you guys. If you want to, take a screenshot of this. Just go ahead and screenshot and, and reference this whenever you're practicing drawing it yourself. This alone could probably help you with eight questions on the test, guys. So I really do hopefully hope that you're taking the taking advantage of this and and learning from, from this webinar. All right. Postseason, we're just moving into active rest. So these this is when your athletes are doing non-sport specific movements, general circuit training, cross training, swimming, active rest, that kind of thing. If you guys are catching the replay, I hope you're getting the most out of this. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me by email, Instagram, DM, whatever after this. Uh, I'm not promising that I'll get back to you right away, but I will I really try to get back to everyone on there. All right, let's keep rolling through here, guys. Um, some key facts for sports psychology, understanding the stages of motor learning. I actually just did a post on motor learning on my Instagram, the movement system. If you like to get nerdy about movement and movement science and motor learning, go check that out um, and follow me there, especially PT students, a lot of PT rehab stuff on there as well. All right, uh, so understanding the stages of motor learning is important. The inverted U theory, uh, the, the big principle here is look at the graphs on the in the book because that's what makes the most sense. But there's an optimal point of arousal. And arousal means like stimulation, like crowd noise and, and, and uh, like caffeine and stuff like that that gets you stimulated. There's an optimal amount of stimulation. And say for golf, it's probably lower. You need more concentration and less stimulation for golf. For a sport that requires more power, say javelin, there's a high demand for arousal and a low demand for concentration and and parasympathetic type stimulation is not important for javelin because for javelin it's a it's one effort and the the movement is so practiced 
the javelin throws are practiced hundreds and hundreds of time. So where golf, you have to concentrate and make fine motor control type adjustments to your swing. Javelin, it's a big, powerful throw. So it's higher arousal for javelin, lower arousal for, for golf. And, and that applies to other sports, but that's just kind of one example there. Most understudied chapter award. So the most understudied chapter, this is at the very end, is the facility design, layout, and organization. No one really goes into strength conditioning to learn about facility design and layout and protocols and emergency preparedness plans, but it's super important, guys. Study this chapter. Make it all the way through the back of the book. If you have to do it earlier to get yourself to actually get through it, do it. Um, but some key facts are like things about mirrors, how far they should be off the ground, how far apart barbells should be placed in the gym, um, the ceiling height for the gym, about 12 feet. Things like that are really important to know. So, so definitely make sure you do read that chapter and get that kind of information out of this. All right, guys, big concept here. I really recommend, guys, try to as much as you can understand versus memorizing. Memorizing is short term and it really doesn't help you become a good strength coach. Try to answer the question of why. So just constantly ask yourself why. If, if you're memorized, if you're trying to memorize something, even something as simple as, you know, keeping the barbells 20 inches off the ground, figure out why. The, the why for that is actually because the bar, the, the plate, if you, if you have a weight plate, is 16 or 18 inches. So if you lean a weight plate against the wall, it won't hit the mirror if it's 20 inches above the ground. It gives you a little wiggle room. So every question, try to figure out why so that way you can actually understand and remember without having to necessarily memorize. Uh, know how the numbers relate to your athletes and, and really try to understand the stuff for yourself and for your athletes. All right, study timeline. Guys, If uh, a lot of people have used this study calendar. This is the order that I recommend studying things in, getting the foundation first and then moving through the chapters pretty much in order with some exceptions. If you want the study calendar, guys, just, just jump in the Facebook group and I, it's tagged as the, the very top of the strength conditioning study group. I made this because so many people ask me, what order should I study and how long should I take to study? This is a general study calendar, it's about two months, but a lot of people are gonna require longer than that. So I will say, you may have to spread this out, but I just wanted it to fit on one page. But that said, guys, if you have an exercise science background, two to three months may be appropriate if you're studying a good five to 10 hours per week. Um, if you don't have an exercise science background, I would honestly spend six to eight months studying. Think about it this way, guys. This is the exam that shows the world that you are a strength conditioning coach. You shouldn't take the exam if you're not confident telling people and showing people that you are a qualified strength conditioning coach. So if you don't have a background in exercise science and physiology and training, you need to spend a significant amount of time actually becoming a good strength coach and being prepared before you take the exam. Six to eight months is not unreasonable by any means. It may even take you a year plus if you have no background in this and you want to switch from a business or another type career of a career. Okay. Ideally doing an internship or shadowing. I know it's tough right now, but that really can be helpful for, for this exam. Uh, one other tip is if you can schedule the exam out like a month or so, that might help you really stay prepared at the end as that deadline approaches. Some other study resources, guys, some supplemental information, uh, the strength conditioning study group on Facebook. We do Facebook Live study questions and, and discussions on there. Uh, YouTube videos. I'm really trying to put a lot of good YouTube videos out there. So if you're not yet following the movement system on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe and you'll get all the updates for those videos. And then also searching the movement system podcast on Spotify. And this next slide might have a little surprise for you guys. We just did one. So, uh, you know, Michael and I just knocked out a podcast earlier this week. Uh, rehab and reconditioning, specifically CSCS, rehab and reconditioning information, because we love you guys. And we appreciate you coming onto this webinar and always supporting the group and watching everything, leaving good comments. Uh, so go ahead. And if you haven't checked out the Movement System podcast, let's get these ratings up. I see 29 five-star ratings on Ooh. here. Let's get that, bump that up. And as those ratings go up, guys, I get more downloads. And that really does help with me spending more time on this. And, and recording more podcasts and getting other guests. You know, I'd really like to be able to reach out to some other people in the field and show that I have this good podcast that's good following and they should come on and be a guest. So that way you guys get better content. So it works both ways. 
All right. Uh, this is one thing I just wanted to touch on quickly. This isn't the whole point of the webinar, but I just want to touch on because people had, did have questions about this. How do you actually get a job in strength conditioning once you're done? I recommend people to have a long-term outlook. I would contact the person that you want to work with, the ideal position that you want a year in advance. So if you're studying for the CSCS right now and you're going to take it in six months and then you're going to be looking for a job right now, tomorrow or the, you know, the next day, go email the person that you want to eventually work with and ask them exactly what you need to be doing right now to be a top candidate for their position. That's going to show them that you have good initiative, that you have good work ethic and that you have a learning and growth mindset and whatever they say, go do it. Go read the articles that they recommend. Go do the experiences. Maybe they offer you an internship. Uh, maybe they just give you a good direction. But that's a good way to start getting your foot in the door and be prepared early. Hopefully that's a good helpful tip for you guys. That's exactly what I would do if I was looking for a strength conditioning job right now. All right. Um, get an internship, college or private sector. Try to find a, a good facility for that if you can. Um, and then also focus on the knowledge, not just the certifications, guys and build your communication skills as well. Really important. Um, some bonus tips, guys. Try to, if you're using Google and YouTube, try to do one topic at a time. One topic at a time or else it gets overwhelming. Try, the more specific you can search, the better of an answer you can find. Um, also, if you can, spend at least a month tracking your own macros. Just go download My Fitness Pal and track your own macros so you can actually see, if I'm saying 150 grams for a basketball player, of protein, but you have no idea what that means, track your macros, see what yours are, see if you're in the right range. And if you could check yourself to see if you're in the right range, then you can apply that to other athletes and, and have it make more sense to you. Uh, also follow a strength conditioning program, reach out to a coach, find a program and actually follow a program and see what it's like. Um, keep yourself accountable with a study plan and then also try to take a good practice test before you go. So guys, a quick checklist here. Are you ready to take the test? So what do you guys think? Are you ready? Are you ready right now? Do you need some time? What do you think? So here, guys, are you able to write a basic strength conditioning program? Ideally, maybe on Excel or some software, but at least on paper, are you able to actually write a strength conditioning program and understand those decisions you're making? If you check yes, awesome. Work on some of the other things. But if not, Keep working on that, guys. Keep writing and programs. Put them on paper. Practice this stuff. Uh, can you complete macronutrient calculations? So can you look at an athlete's macronutrients and, and see if they need to adjust one way or the other? See if they're under-consuming or over-consuming calories. Practice yourself. Practice with questions. Practice with a book. Make those connections. Are you able to actually classify sports based on energy systems and then determine the work to rest ratios appropriately? So can you actually go all the way from watching a sport that you don't understand or, or maybe don't have a lot of familiarity with and, and analyze the efforts of those sports? Those are those athletes are doing eight second work bouts. They need to be using their ATP PC system. They need a one to 12 to one to 20 work to rest ratio. Can you do that for every sport, literally every sport, and actually calculate these work to rest ratios, actually apply these to questions? If not, keep working on it. Uh, can you actually explain how eating food all the way from eating something goes down to the muscle and actually results in a muscle contraction? Can you explain how food goes through the digestive system, into the bloodstream, goes through bioenergetic processes, becomes blood sugar, and then becomes ATP, and then a signal goes from your brain through your nerve, all the way down to your muscle, it goes through the sarcoplasmic reticulum, moves the tropomyosin, creates an actin and myosin overlap, and the cross bridge cycle occurs. And that's the sliding filament theory. If that, if you can explain that to your friend, your dog, your whatever, right, then you're ready. If you can't make all of those connections yet, and then also take a practice test. Practice test, try to find a good one that has the explanations of every answer. The practice test that I made has a paragraph explaining every single one of the 100 plus questions on the practice test. And I did that because none of the other practice tests that I could find are actually good enough that they actually explain every single question. So ideally try to take a good practice test. Uh, you can always message me if you want to see the one that I have. But yeah, take a good practice test and that will really help you see where these gaps are for you and what you need to keep working on. Also, guys, so if you're wondering, uh, you know, how do I learn more from you, Matt? You seem like you know a lot. 
Um, first of all, I only know a lot because I've taken a lot of notes, spent a lot of time answering questions for you guys. And I've really spent the last year building two resources that are super helpful for helping people pass the CSES test. So over 100 people have taken advantage of the practice test and the strength conditioning course that I have. Those are the two resources. So one is the practice test. The, you could also go to smartstrengthcoach.com and there's a link to get the practice test on there. Uh, but the course is really the ultimate compilation of all the things that I, I tried to teach people and giving people as many of those aha moments. And that's how it works. And what the heck, that's how it works. Those kind of moments. Um, so the, the strength conditioning study course, or the CSCS prep course that I have is a compilation of about 18 hours of video content. So videos just like this with PowerPoints where I'm walking through step by step uh, each topic from the exam. So we're going through nutrition and we're just going diving into a one hour video all on nutrition and going through questions, going through the theory, going through the application to athletes, that kind of thing. And then if you sign up for the course, basically you can watch that video on, at your own pace and then move on to the next video, move on to the endocrine video, move on to the testing and administration video, move on to the periodization video, and at your own pace, basically work through all those, all those videos. Uh, there's quizzes for each module. But that is the strength and conditioning study course. It's my ultimate compilation of all of my knowledge into some videos and quizzes and notes that you guys can use to actually learn the theory and really understand this material. Uh, if you're watching the replay and you catch this and you don't get us live, you can always just send me a question question or post a question to the strength and conditioning study group on Facebook. But let's get to as many of these as we can. For the practical applied portion, what chapters should you focus on? Plyometrics, periodization, both really important. Plyometrics, you want to understand like the volume of plyometric training, right? Like is 80 reps of squat jumps a lot? Is that a little bit? Is that good for a beginner? Is that good for an intermediate? Is that good for an advanced athlete, an older adult, like 50 years or older? What type of modifications do you have to have for that? Those are all questions you should know. I think there's two plyometrics chapters, if I remember correctly, but you'll want to know the scientific portions of that, the stretch shortening cycle, how the tendon elasticity and stiffness affects jumping and sprinting, rate of force development, depth jumps versus squat jumps versus non-counter movement jumps. If this sounds like a lot of information, it is. The course actually breaks down all of those things and gives examples, but definitely go through the chapter and uh, focus on the plyometrics. That's really important. Also the periodization. I would know the aerobic programming as well. So uh, what's the difference between interval training, high intensity interval training, fartlek training, things like that, steady state training. There's a specific set of physiological adaptations with each. So as much as you can, guys, and I know this is tough, but try to relate the, the practical application stuff, make those connections all the way from the cardiovascular physiology section to the practical application section in the, in the programming aerobic training section. Try to make those connections as, as best you can. How do we apply the CSCS information as a DPT? That's a really good question. I've been working on that. that. That's really what my Instagram is all about, is applying some of these strength conditioning principles to rehab protocols. And actually, watch the podcast that we just did. Yeah, It's like 30 minutes all about exactly that. So I'll just leave sure. it there. But there's a lot of good things from the CSCS book that can make you a really great clinician. So yeah, definitely highly recommend making those connections. What kind of current information should I be studying? This is tough. So I should post this. There's a pyramid of, of research, basically. There are lower level studies and higher level studies. Uh, there's If you want to determine if the FMS, like the functional movement screen, is effective or not, you can find 100 studies that say it is and 100 studies that say it isn't because of low sample sizes, right? But then there's some studies that compile a lot of other studies, and we call those uh, meta-analyses um, or systematic reviews in some cases, and there's basically different levels of evidence. I would, if I was you guys in, in your position, try to study the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis more than the case studies or the individual like 20 sample size of 20 type studies. Because the problem with reading a study with a sample size of 10 or a sample size of 20, a lot of times those studies are actually came to a conclusion that's not necessarily in consensus with the overall body of evidence. So those bigger studies that combine a lot of little studies 
are the ones that bring together all the research and, and get more of a consensus type thing. And I'm going to try to keep posting quality studies to the strength conditioning study group to help you guys understand these, these things more and, and be able to read high quality evidence. Is the quiz on your study course the same questions as your practice test? No, the practice test and the study course are two completely separate products. And I wanted to make it that way because if someone's four days out, they don't have time to necessarily go through 18 hours of video content and 100 quiz questions right in my study course. So they could just do the practice test. But other people that are three months out have bought both the practice test and the study course. So they're completely different. There are no uh, none of the same questions. It's designed just like the, the CSES test with three answer choices for each question. You take it one question at a time, you get your score on the exercise science portion, and then you can you know review your answers then if you want to, and then go on to the practical application, take that test, get your score, and then check your answers there. The quiz is broken down into four or five questions per video, basically, and those are separate questions from the practice test. Um, yeah, and then there's quizzes and then there's also a shorter practice test that comes with the course. So actually the strength conditioning study course comes with the practice test, but it's, it's shorter than the full practice test. All right. So let's keep going here. Um, there's a good amount of videos on the Facebook group, but not on the YouTube channel yet. Will you have them up soon? The YouTube videos are a little bit different than the Facebook group. YouTube videos, I try to do one topic each. So they're, they're generally 10 minute videos on YouTube. Uh, there's some longer ones. The nutrition one's like 17 minutes or something. But the YouTube, I try to do one topic, linear periodization or um, nutrition or something. They're not nearly as in-depth as what you would get in the strength conditioning study course, but they cover one topic and give you some good information. Uh, but I'm going to keep doing YouTube videos based on different topics. You know, I'm going to try to do this as much as I can while doing a full-time clinical. But more YouTube videos to come for sure. So I have a whole list of ones to get to. Get to. Um, example of questions they would ask in the video and pictures section. I'm working on that right now. That's been delayed because of the gym shutdown, but I'm working on a entire exercise technique module for the strength conditioning study course and going to post a few of those exercise technique videos to YouTube or, or to the Facebook group as well. I'm working on those ones right now. Uh, in terms of periodization, do you recommend we practice specific sports or focus on general linear periodization? Both. Both would be good, actually. Um, I would be able to write a general linear periodization program just like just like this one that I was showing you guys in the in the PowerPoint slides. I would be able to write a general one, but then it would be actually really good if you could if you could write one that's for soccer that maybe involves more a little bit more aerobic component, and then one for football which involves more power, and then one for um, you know, go by sport. So I think it, it would be beneficial to go sport by sport as well. Can you pass the course by just self-studying? Yes, absolutely. You definitely do not need the strength conditioning study course. It's been a really helpful resource for a lot of people. I've found that the people who are really visual learners and vibe with my style of teaching really do well with the study course. But by all means, a lot of people have passed just by reading the book and by reading current research. Uh, the, the strength conditioning study course is just a, a lot of visual resources, me explaining it in a different way. I recommend that people who go through the strength conditioning study course still read the book in conjunction, and it just helps tie the concepts together um, because I can pull things from the cardiovascular physiology and tie it, you know, to the programming and, and see it and, and kind of make those connections for you. But you can absolutely just take notes, go through the book. That's how I passed. Um, you absolutely can do it without just with the book. Should a strength conditioning coach go for a nutrition coach coaching course? Um, I don't know a lot about nutrition coaching courses. I know that there's the ISSN, the International Society of Sports Nutrition. There's there's other ones out there. The ISSN is kind of similar to the CSCS. It's evidence based. They're the leaders in uh, a lot of research. So that's, I actually read the entire ISSN book. It's 700 pages and it's just like the CSCS book, super detailed about amino acids and supplements. It's like super nerdy that I actually read that book. <laughs> I didn't even take the certification. It was too expensive. It's like a $800 certification or something like that. And I just liked, I, I prefer coaching to nutrition, but I actually read the entire book and it's, it's really good. It's, it's really a, a good amount of information. But there are other nutrition certifications. If that's something you want to get into, 
Remember, there is a limited scope of practice for strength coaches. We need to understand nutrition, but not give meal plans, not give diet advice. And I really do recommend that people stick with that scope of practice because like the most simple things, like you might think, oh, every, but everyone needs leafy green vegetables. Well, before you know it, you're going to be on, you know, talking to someone that's on a potassium spirit sparing diuretic that you didn't know about. And then leafy green vegetables aren't good for them. And they actually need to limit certain micronutrients. So like, don't give specific food advice, um, but understand nutrition for performance and within your scope. Oh, no calculator in the CSCS. What's the best way to do math? I would practice on a whiteboard because I think that's what they give you everywhere. <laughs> We're over here with our fingers. Actually, do, though, do practice this. Um, also, there's this thing with division and multiplication where they work in reverse. So practice ways to check your answer, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of things that you could do two different ways. So the nutrition calculations, for example, you could you could work backwards and calculate the minimum and maximum, or you can give get the information they have and then work to find the grams per kilogram body weight that they're currently at and see if that's within the range. So there's a lot of questions where you could do it two different ways. And if you can do it both ways, then you could check your answer. Uh, but yeah, just work on doing it by hand. Uh, I know it's annoying, but work on doing it by hand because you need to know how to do that. Same with the Carbonin formula, stuff like that. For testing norms, what percentiles should we know for sure? This is tough. Within the strength conditioning study course, I've given some specific recommendations, but I haven't put a chart out there of like what to memorize for a good vertical jump, for a good bench press, for that. I really haven't put that out there. And the reason for that is that there's an element of sports specificity to it, right? So even though a 45 VO2 max is pretty good for a female basketball player, if you're in a sport that has less of an aerobic contribution to it, you're a, a shot put athlete or something like that, a power athlete, a good VO2 max isn't the same as a good VO2 max for that aerobic sport. So it's tough to just say, oh, oh, just memorize the 60th percentile for VO2 max because you still have to consider the sports specificity element to it too. So I would generally know, like you, you need to know that, you know, 100 isn't really a VO2 max. Like no one, I don't think any, that might be above the world record, right? And in 20 is like, you know, like you need some serious like cardio, cardiac rehab because that's super low VO2 max. Like I would know kind of the general range for numbers and what's generally a good number, but it's not as simple as just memorizing, you know, a certain number and then applying it in all cases, right? Uh, so that is that is a tough question there. Youth training. There actually is a whole section on youth training here. Um, did I, I did a Facebook Live at, at some point about youth training, I think. So if you dig back into the Facebook group, you might be able to find that youth training uh, Facebook Live for, for, for more information about that. You have to retake the scientific, but now it's 2020 and you took it the first time in 2019. Um, obviously, it'll be different. Um, the, I, the scientific foundation, I think the, the main change that they did was adding more psychology. So psychology is on the scientific foundations, not the practical applied. So um, I think the main thing is, is more psychology questions. They did update some statistics as well. That's kind of within the testing and administration section. So Again, focus on those those three to four chapters that I said are most important, uh, and that that should be honestly. It, this, someone asked, uh, "Can you explain scoring?" I'm not sure exactly what I need to pass. I would reference the NSCA website for that. I don't feel exactly comfortable with that because I'm not. I don't want to give you something that's not exactly right. I think it's about a seventy percent to pass, but there are some questions on there that are unscored questions. So you could have just by uh, bad luck gotten a bunch of the unscored questions right and a bunch of the scored questions wrong. And 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 some people get really upset about that. So I don't want to give you some information that's that's misleading. Okay. Um, most important things to write down in your scratch paper before you begin the test. That's interesting. Uh, I honestly hadn't thought of doing that. It's probably a good idea. Uh, obviously, you can't bring like notes in or anything, or else everyone would just bring my like, <laughs> all the notes that I've made. Bring it right uh, in. They'd bring them right into the test and pass. But um, people be selling it in the lobby. You want to yeah, copy right? ten bucks? Well, you didn't know Matt. Well, I actually no. Um, don't sell my notes. I don't even sell my notes. They're free to you guys. The 
the uh, obviously the course notes are are more in depth than paid, but like the the free notes I give. But anyway, um, you could write you could get right into the test, and as you get to the first question, you could write down maybe work to rest ratios like uh, ATP PC systems one to twelve to one to twenty, and then one to three to one to five, one to one to one to three based on like anaerobic aerobic. That might not be a bad chart to scratch down like a tic tac toe kind of board thing. Protein recommendations carb recommendations. You could write the Carbonin formula if you want, things like that. I have a YouTube video on that if you're not sure what the Carbonin formula is. Uh, but yeah, don't take too much time, right? Because you only have a certain amount of time for the test. So, but you could maybe jot those things down. I don't know how big of a whiteboard they give you though. So that's something to think about. Don't, don't plan on relying on that. All right. Um, explain the difference between exergonic and endergonic. That's going to have to Go to the bioenergetics video on YouTube. That's like a loaded question for a webinar. Just search bioenergetics on YouTube uh, or the movement system bioenergetics. Uh, and I can talk more about that. All right, guys. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get through too many more. We're already over an hour. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Dude, Michael, thanks so much for having me on for this. I really appreciate you taking the time to set this up. Everyone, thank Michael for setting oh, this up. Thanks, I really, really do appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone that's gotten a lot out of this really appreciates your time in that. Yeah, you are, you are an awesome guest. So I appreciate you coming in and uh, devoting uh, an hour, an hour and a half tonight to teaching everybody what you are best at. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Even if you take two one, two, or three like golden nuggets from this webinar, then I hope it helps you pass the test and good luck to those that are taking it soon and good luck to those that are taking it sometime in the future. Uh, guys, don't forget to tag us if you haven't yet on uh, Instagram. And, you know, I hope I hope we see you guys uh, around, you know, in the group. Michael's always hanging out in our group as well, uh, answering questions, giving, giving some knowledge bombs. So Try my best. I, I hope we see you guys around. All righty. All right, we're going to end this and we'll uh, send you out the replay tomorrow. All right, cool. See you guys.